love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, man. I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tune into the ACCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouse. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They can press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike and Charles. Charles and Mike, but Mike is on assignment. Mike had so much fun at homecoming. I'm thinking he's still trying to find wellness. Uh, in terms of that, but it may be something else. Maybe he's actually busy, but I thought I would tell on him just a bit. But we had a great da- time down there at Prairie View and m University. Like a lot of HBCU alumni, fans, and students have at their particular homecoming. With that being said, it was homecoming throughout the MEAC with three of the teams hosting the other three teams. First week, three of them had homecomings. All homecoming teams won too, as well. But that's a little bit. We'll get into the mid-major. With that being said, welcome to episode 573 of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab, radio show and podcast. The show that's covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports from institutions large and small, from the NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBCU sports. Short we just call it HBCU Sports Pedagogy. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to KCH 1230 AM Studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper, and the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Without further ado, let me welcome in the co-host, the guest uh, of the show, we have the professors on duty. My partner in crime, Charles Bishop. I won't tell only too hard. <laughs> also, we have A.D. Drew as he's driving the truck and always finding a way to back clean up. And I say that on purpose with the World Series taking place and what just happened in some of those games. I mm. um, and with that, let me introduce... Mr. Since he's still trying to figure out if I know who the hell he is. <laughs> Milton Jackson, the second. How you doing? I am doing good, Dr. Cavill. It's glad it's good to be here. Good to have you. It's my understanding that you're seeking to um adjust your payroll because you're thinking about joining us twice this week. So you're trying to double dip and make sure you get in the pockets a little more than usual. Yeah, just, just, just a little bit. Not not not, not too much. I understand. We welcome it. We welcome it. You, you, you are a part of the team officially now. We've recruited you, um, fresh out of all the money that you cost us. But it's actually pretty good. You actually do well. Uh, the dividends are playing off. I must say that. With that being said, welcome to all of y'all. Welcome to all the lab listeners out there enjoying the show, popping off and getting ready. We're getting to that point. We did our mid grade analysis we starting to see maybe in some areas what we think teams are in other areas we're still trying to figure out uh, but shout out to all those lab listeners out there in today's episode of inside the hbc sports lab is sponsored by thd agency thd agency is a company that provides sporting and educational consulting analytics with that being said charles let me jump right to you and let you jump off where you want to start uh with the swag comments this week <laughs> yeah, well, uh, let's actually start right there. Uh, 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 Southwestern Athletic Conference is publicly reprimanded and levied a fine of five thousand dollars to Grambling State's head football coach, making Joseph for his comments related to officiating. The comments were made during a weekly head coach's uh, media session on Monday, following Grambling's uh, football contest with Texas Southern. Uh, Joseph's comments were made in violation of Section Two, Article Twelve, Item One. 
calls for an imposition of a penalty of the SWAT Constitution bylaws and sports regulations. So future violations of the Conference Code of Ethics will resort uh, will result in additional penalties for Joseph, including an increased fine amount along with a one game suspension. So that of course made the news yesterday. I was listening in to that call and my eyebrow immediately went up like uh oh <laughs> Coach, like coach, you can't do that anywhere, any level, anymore. Does it work? Um, yeah. They're gonna get you to find. You probably say, "Hey, you pay that institution." You you kind of look twice. That one game suspension will probably get your attention. Mm. Mm -hmm. No matter what's going on. And it's kind of you interesting, know. Doc. You know, I mean, you, you take a look at it. I mean, <laughs> I you you have to be, have that super fandom thing going if you still think referees have it out for you or whatever the case might be. So it's it's kind of like, eh. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, obviously you have some referees make a bad call here and there, but nobody is personally uh, having a reason. First of all, I try to tell a lot of folks, it's like coaches. If you like coaches not playing the best player or whatever, I think y'all forget what these gentlemen are being played. Even the women, when you talk about on their side of the sports, referees as well. Nobody in their right mind very rarely, you know, we had the NBA thing and it's usually at that high level. We had obviously the baseball panel that goes so far back that we can't even remember the date. We just know it was in the early 1800s, uh, whatever, early 1900s, I guess it was in terms of what White Sox scandal, as we all know. But the money's so big that it's not realistic that folks are not going to do their best. Hmm. Many of these folks don't have another option where they can make that same kind of money. Let's put that up. Well, you're not just going to give away your options to make significant money uh, unless you really have a serious problem. So people are not just like putting in there. So you're right. It's funny when you hear, you know, I might say there's some bad referee and stuff like that, but it's not just adjudicated. You, yeah. Usually when you look at this on both sides, there might be some calls that are more crucial than others. I'm not saying that, but it's not like just perfect. And I, I've had the opportunity to kind of sit through the level of review. I mean, they literally go through their own position Zoom calls through the week. There's an overall, you know, call where they're taking a look at what was uh, – they're being evaluated essentially game to game. There are multiple meetings through the course of the week. There is a huge uh, 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 sort of retreat, if you will, for officials here in Houston. Uh, in fact, the uh, director of SWAT football – uh, officiating uh, Eddie Kelly has a huge camp here in Houston where they do review, 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 review film work and uh, position drills out there on the football field. So, you know, uh, these guys are vetted and they, they do quite a lot during the course of the week. So. Uh, we got A.D. Drew, like he in class for real. He got his hands up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, what I really have to say is, uh, uh, I've, I've, I've officiated, I've officiated yep. at the high school level. I've officiated at the collegiate level. Mm, that's right. Referees are not out to gig. Coaches. And we talk, you talk about bad ref laws. I really need to explain something to people and help them understand something. There are two types of calls that an official makes, no matter what sport it is. One is a rule application. Mm. The other one is a judgment call. Mm -hmm. yep. Referees, 100% of the time, are expected to get the rules right. Judgment is exactly what that is, a judgment call. Now, what do I, what, I'm going to give you a an example, and I was talking to uh, Coach Norman uh, earlier today. We, we were talking about this. Pass interference. We all know that a pass interference, offensive pass, uh, excuse me, defensive pass interference is a 15-yard penalty, mm -hmm. except, it, with it, except inside the 30, where it becomes half the distance, unless it occurs in the end zone if then you spot the ball on the two-yard line. A lot of people may not have known that that's basically how that rule reads. Okay, that's the rule. That is the rule. So right. you're, that referee is expected to spot the ball at the appropriate point based upon the penalty. 
whether a past interference is called or not is the judgment portion of that rule. That is 100% up to that referee, his vantage point, his viewpoint of the play, and when the contact may have or may not have occurred and was any advantage uh, get gained by either party. That's the judgment part of it. You can't, argue, you can't argue the judgment part. What I can argue, that ball is supposed to be spotted at the 12-yard line. You just spotted the ball at the 8. That's what you can argue all day long because you just misapplied the rule. But the fact whether that was a pass interference or not, that's 100% judgment. You may not like it. And if that referee can come over to that head coach and, and sell his call or give further justification on what he saw, coaches are supposed to be happy because you also forgot our coach. So I understand both sides of this coin. And I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but when a coach goes off like that publicly, only officials, what do you think is going to be the outcome of that? That questionable call from now on, every official know he just got called out. They just got called out. That questionable call from now on may not go in your favor. So, coaches, beware. Be careful when you do that. That's why they give you this, 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 the, the, uh, the 20-minute cooling off period. Well, hell, Coach Joseph he didn't, he didn't use that 20-minute cooling off period or a 24-hour cooling off period in this case. <laughs> <laughs> let, me let, let me let Wilton Jack. I'm Jack sorry. I'm sorry, Doc. No, I thought your explanation was really good, but I want to get Wilton in here. His thoughts on this comment before we get prepared. Getting up no, my mine kind of echoes what what Ad Drew said. Like you can't make a you, you, if the call is the call, you you can't really argue. Obviously, we see coaches do it all the time. But to your point, uh, Ad, when you say like if the ball is on the twelve, if the ball is supposed to be on 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 the eight and it's on the twelve, then yeah, I can argue that. I can say, hey, where are my extra four yards? I need I need the ball. If I if I got my players down there or my players got the ball to that particular yard line, this is where it needs to be. But if it's a pass interference and it's a blatant pass interference and I'm just arguing about it, it's not going to – I mean, in the moment, I'm thinking, like, I'm trying to fight for my players. But later on, once I calm down some, which, like, you to your point when you said he didn't have that 20-minute grace period, it's like, man, I might have kind of put myself in a, a far worse situation long term. Good points. The other thing is I got two cheat codes. I get to ask Charles, A.D. Drew. <laughs> He drew in terms of actually doing it, and then he has colleagues he can reach out to. Charles reaches out to his colleagues. And there's certain things, and I think I know some, and these rules change so fast and so furious. And you're watching it, particularly those that watch both NFL and college, which have some difference in the rules. It's amazing how many times I come back and be like, well, this is the rule. I'll be like, damn, yeah, it changed. Now I updated, so now I can go tell somebody else. Uh, but it's amazing. Even when I think I'm just like, I know this and this and that, it comes back and be like, nope, <laughs> it changed last year, it changed a year ago. <laughs> or I misinterpreted the way I thought the rule was until I get clarification. So even in that case, I've had to admit to myself, I'm like, hmm, they got it right. Got mm -hmm. it right. Mm -hmm. Got it right. More, especially more than not. Uh, let's take our first break. We'll come back on the other side. Get into the poll rankings, and then we'll come back and do some accolades from the SWAC and uh, Football Weekly Honors. We still want to get that out there. We'll do that um, after we release the poll rankings in this second segment. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. Looking for the ultimate cultural experience of 2025? The Zora Outdoor Festival of the Arts is where you need to be. From January 31st to February 2nd, Eatonville, Florida will come alive with incredible live performances from the Lavert Experience and Sunshine Anderson. Immerse yourself in interactive art, take a journey through history with a new virtual tour app that brings Eatonville's legacy to life from your phone. Enjoy family-friendly STEM activities and explore over 80 unique vendors. Please don't miss the unforgettable R&B tribute to the legends. This is more than a festival. It's a celebration of Eatonville's rich cultural heritage. Visit ZoraFestival.org for tickets or to become a vendor. We'll see you in Eatonville, the oldest black incorporated municipality in the country. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love that. And who the ball? Who the ball? 
So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, And pay attention yes, Cause he gonna teach a lesson yes. This is Dr. Mills inside the HBC Sports Lab We're into our second segment And it's time to talk about those rankings It's week number 8 at the mid-major level You know that's D2 um, NIA programs And we have an update as I told you, as we get into the season, you get your solidification of your teams in the top seven. And to some degree, even, you know, around that top eight or so, you had those teams that kind of stay where they are for the most part. Um, and fascinating in terms of how that works out. You may have some teams that drop in and out of that six, seven spot. But most teams are pretty slotted there. And you really start to see the cream rise to the crop in terms of who's number one, two or three. Every once in a while, you get your major upsets. But you get your rankings of one, two, and they start to last for several periods of time. Well, we'll see what that looks like today. I can give you a little eddy, uh, early headshot um, in the fact that we had one team that dropped out. But let's get right into it and talk about that team that dropped out this week. West Virginia State Yellow Jackets sit at mm. five, four, and two. They fell out. I know you all were not all that excited about West Virginia State, and you said it was going to happen. Well, well, no cheese. Yep, looks like you all know a little bit about your football. Um, and they <laughs> have dropped out, uh, particularly after a big, huge defeat last weekend. Um, that's two straight losses for them that drops them out of the poll. So those receiving votes, let's get into that. Not changes here. A little bit in the point numbers here, but everybody is still sitting right here. Virginia State Trojans sit at 5-3, and 4-1, and one, 114 points. Florida Memorial. Sit at four, two, and one, three and one, as they won their second consecutive game, and Trojans are rolling as well. Uh, but the Florida Memorial Lions sit at 112 uh, points. Fort Valley State, uh, the Wildcats are at five, mm. five and one, 111, just outside of that. They're quietly getting things done, uh, maybe setting up for a big matchup against Albany State. And because I mentioned Albany State, which is a couple of games away. I'll tell you, Albany State is actually at 11. They're sitting right outside of that as well. With that being said, um, let's get in the top seven. Kudos to A.D. Drew. He said that they, Tuskegee, Golden Tigers, would be creeping towards that ranking. He also said about the SIAC matchups would be coming around late in the season as the CIAA would beat each other up and some teams with attrition would have to fall out at some point. Well, guess what? The Golden Tigers, I'm going to say A.D. Drew's Golden Tigers are in the mix. A&M, 5-1, 122 points. And I know you work at the other schools, so I'm going to save you and just say he's also <laughs> have Maroon Tigers as well. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I got you. Number six, Clark and Lava Panthers sit at 5-2 and two and 1-4-2, one, and two, 135 <laughs> points, 7 points. I know I'm going to ask you to talk about the poll rankings, but a little early cheat code as we get later in the show. We'll talk about this matchup because it is a top seven matchup between uh, Clark Atlanta Panthers and Ski Golden Tigers as the SIC finds a way to be uh, up in a top seven matchup as you got later in the season. So at number six, you got the Clark Atlanta Panthers sitting at five, two, one, four, and two. Let's get into number five. At number five, we have the Langston Lions. Langston Lions sit at five and two, four and one, 139 points. They move up as they continue to win. This is a team started off with two losses, and everybody was, particularly when you got in that conference loss, you're like, what happened to Langston? Well, guess what? Langston is starting to do what we're used to Langston doing, playing some pretty good football. Yeah, they had a little down last year, but they had like five, six consecutive years where they were. Highly ranked all up in the top seven. Well, they're back in the mix. It looks like Lions are back in the football business as well. Getting these top four, still a couple of changes here slightly. Winston Salem State, Rams, with that tough loss, they fall to six and three, four and two. But they start in that top five. In fact, they, they only fall one spot from the three spot. Bring us to number three, Miles Golden Bears. They quietly. Keep marching, 6-2 and 6-0. and oh. One first place votes, 163 points. Number four, if you want to look out long range, and we talked a little bit about that rivalry game between Fort Valley State Wildcats and Albany State. Mm. The Golden Rams, well, you have that one likely too. Miles, Golden Bears, and Tuskegee. And it could be a lot on the line for that matchup for both of these teams. 
But first things are first. Let's look at the clock at Atlanta. Because we didn't match up, but I did want you to know that Miles Golden Bears, they sit at number two, Virginia Union Panthers. They've righted the ship and they're marching down. Six and two, five and up as they just march down the pole. They are consistent now. They're at number two with one first place vote. I won't even say the surprise. This team is just as good as they want to be. Johnson Smith Golden Bulls, eight and oh, five and oh, and they just get it done. Huge win over the Winston-Salem State Rams from just the standpoint, not just in terms of staying top of the rankings, not just staying undefeated in HBCU football, not just staying 5-0 and in terms of undefeated in the conference race, is the fact that they beat Winston-Salem State before I was a little thought of my daddy's pants. So they got it done, scratched off that mark, if you would. Seven first-place votes, 198 points, and they remain number one. And that is for the eight straight weeks in a row, eight straight weeks in a row. They're eight straight weeks at number one, as you can see. Johnson C. Smith, Golden Bulls, Charles. Let me just go to you directly. What are your thoughts in terms of mid-major poll rankings in week number eight? I, I think Tuskegee has a lot of momentum. Uh, what what stands out to me is who's the better five and three team. Uh, and I know the poll is week to week, but who's the better five and three team, Tuskegee or Fort Valley? Uh, especially when you take a look at a common opponent. Tuskegee lost to Savannah State early in the season, and Fort Valley shut Savannah State out. So it, it makes me wonder who who's the better five and three team, uh, especially when you take a look at Tuskegee over their last four games. Uh, I think the total wins of their opponent is like nine wins versus 33 losses. So uh, that's probably my only something where I'm a little, a little bothered down there at the bottom uh, of the pole. But I think when you take a look at one through – the first four teams, they're about right. And then, uh, yeah, I, I can go with the first six. I just had a question about number seven. Yeah, I think you could have picked up a couple of teams. Virginia State Trojans can make an argument. I think yeah. you can even make it for Florida Memorial Lions and might be another team out there. As, as you get in there, I won't, I won't beat you up too bad. I think that's a fair analysis in terms of what it looks like. And there, obviously, it sets up nice that uh, Tuskegee did find the top seven. Now you got a six-seven matchup. <laughs> uh, from that perspective, but mm -hmm. I do agree that you can make an argument. Albany State, Fort Valley State, Florida Memorial, Virginia State Trojans, you start hitting your bet in terms of going back a little bit and seeing when teams lost and how they yeah. lost, yeah. which it's always hard if both teams are winning consistently at the same point of point. Well, how do you jump over a team over a period of time if you had a tough loss? And you just set up and see if we get those matchups at the end of the year, see what they like. With that being said, let me see what Wilton has to say about the top two. So the first four teams, I'm cool. I'm, I'm good with. I think that they are, have pretty much solidified their spots up until this point. Uh, as Charles, like he, like, like he said, um, the polls change week to week, but they've been the, the most consistent teams. The one thing I will say is that I, I kind of had a question of like – to Charles' point, too, who's the better five and three team? Because I actually had – I thought Fort Valley could have actually been in this in this top seven, in my opinion. Um, you can make a case for Virginia State. I know I did. Um, but I know, again, a lot of these teams are about to continue to beat up on each other, and specifically, Dr. Gaville, that matchup when you talk about Albany State coming up in a couple weeks, that's going. I think that's going to play a lot of – it's going to play a big part in kind of deciding some things as the season kind of comes to an end. Um Clark Atlanta actually wasn't in my top seven. I had them on the outside. I had them at eight. Um, and mm. then Tuskegee was uh, actually on the outside, so I had them at nine. So, but other, I mean, other than that, like I'm not, I'm not mad about it. I think this, this is, uh, this is pretty, it's pretty standard. Yeah, and I think as you see, as we said, we're talking about the ten. <laughs> Everybody fine with top four, five. <laughs> They're just yeah. like, hey, hold on, yeah, we, we there. It's the bottom five that you get a little. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's fascinating when you see that because, like you said, I think you can make an argument to your point that Clark Atlanta shouldn't be in there. Yeah. But, yeah, they lost the game, a tough one, top seven team. And sometimes I think we forget not just about wins, but who has quality losses. Exactly. And we forget about those early quality losses, which is normal. We see this in all the poll rankings in all the years, particularly when it was just about the bowl thing. But think about this. Who had a better loss? Tuskegee Golden Tigers. Now that we see Johnson C. Smith 
versus Fort Valley State, and they lost to Clark Atlanta. Hmm. Better loss. Particularly when we see what the CIAA did against the SIAC. So I think you got to think a little bit about that as well when you put all these variables in place. See, y'all forget to look at all those variables. I look at all of the variables. That's why they call me the team. But with that being said, before uh, I shoot off my top a little too much, I'm going to let AD Drew get in here and give his thoughts. The variable you did not mention, Dr. Cavill, was bad. Who of those losses, who actually has the bad loss that sticks That's out? Yeah. You, you know, Tuskegee has a bad loss. Mm-hmm. Clark Atlanta has a bad loss. That's, uh, that's, that's just two of them off the, off, the, uh, off the top of your head. Miles actually has a bad loss to a, uh, to a Division two opponent outside of the conference. So, you know, just some of those things, you know, Virginia Union, quality losses. One to Johnson C, one to Division One. So I, I understand where you're going that same thing with uh Winston Salem State. They have a quality loss in there because of the uh the A and T uh, the A and T loss. But True. obviously we know six 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 or seven somebody gonna not somebody somebody stays, somebody goes uh after Saturday. Yeah. No brainer. No brainer right there. That, that, <laughs> it's overstated obvious. I actually am looking for Langston to slide on up out of here, Dr. Cavill, because Ooh. the back half of Langston's schedule is a monster. Yeah, it is. They, they yeah. got the top some of the top teams in uh in NAIA in that Sooner Athletic Conference. The team that gets no respect is Florida Memorial right now. Florida Memorial is in one of the tougher conferences also, but I think what a lot of us put Langston in based on the name recognition because Langston has that history, that recent history of winning. I agree. Versus, versus Florida Memorial, who came out of nowhere last year, surprised the heck out of everybody. And Coach Bobby Rome is down there showing that uh, this is not a one-trick pony as he's uh, having uh, success again. But I argue. Virginia State and or Fort Valley State should be in here. If I had, and obviously we know we know the rules of the game, Dr. Greer. If you put one in, you have to take one out. Well, talk, talk to me. Now, I am honestly, I love my NAIAs, but I have to pull Langston out because the, the, the Langston has beaten the teams they're supposed to have beaten. Mm. They ha- they don't have anything that really and, and be understanding and knowing the NAI they really don't have a quality victory. They just right. the team what they're supposed to be. I agree. That's true. So now the question for me is which one of those teams would I put in? Would I put in Fort Valley? Would I put in Virginia State? I'm not going to answer that, but that's going to be a little bit of a longer debate. But <laughs> I get I tell you, one of those two should be in ahead of Langston. CIAA is a stronger conference this, this year, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. he, Charles, you can say that. Okay. You can say that. Yeah, I mean, you, you said it, not me, Charles. So, you know, so, that, so that's the one that I would put in, and I would actually probably slide that team into like some slot nice and slot. Mm-hmm. Man, that's – hey, I think you all did your best analysis I've seen you all done over the last two or three years. I'm serious. If I was reading the dissertation, I'd be like, bucking it up. Let's go. He's done. Or if you did a major research paper, I was like, yep, yeah, this is A+. Plus. I haven't seen anything. Else. We got to publish this. This is good. This is good work. Great analysis. I will add, though, uh, to your point, Drew, I'm interested in the Florida Memorial Alliance in the schedule in terms of the toughness as you talk about that conference. Um, they have a chance to do it. But I think now that tie between Clark Atlanta and Florida Memorial is actually hurting both teams. If one of those teams could have finished the game and got the win, imagine what we'd be talking about. I think it hurts Clark Atlanta more than it hurts Florida Memorial. Yeah, I'm saying on on both sides. But even that, as you're talking about Florida Memorial, you're hedging your bets. You're looking at a 5-2 and Florida Memorial team. 
you know, versus just four and two. And they now they look sharper against those other five, three teams they're with. <laughs> or if you had Clark Atlanta sitting at six and two. So that not getting to be able to play that out is starting to hurt some teams in terms of that. Somebody wants to move on six. I'm not hating on the F9 SIC teams. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you get your points there. And people have forgot the history that Langston and uh, Lincoln, Missouri, actually got approved for the SIEC. Um, then there was a change in presidents, and they pulled out before they actually started um, a major conference competition. They played a couple of games. With that being said, let's get into our next break. We'll come back on the other side. We'll let Charles um, talk about the superlatives for the SWAC. And then we'll let ADU talk about the superlatives for the MEAC. Um, and we'll start getting in some discussion of some of these matchups. And we'll even let Wilton decide what news he wants to drop for the day. Uh, make sure everybody gets a chance to do that as we back that up to the second part. Let's get in our second break. We'll come back on the other side and get to it. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonya sent you. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want to love you. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention because he gonna teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Break. I'm coming back with the professors, particularly after that sake. Oh, my goodness, man. What a breakdown. And great dialogue in terms of Dr. Bill's mid-major division top seven uh, in terms of what it's going to be interesting going down the stretch. Who can find a way to close out and end the season in such a way that they can brag and say, hey, we closed out the season either with a championship or certainly we're in the mix in terms of being top seven. With that being said, Charles, uh, give us some superlatives on the SWAC or MEAC, whichever one you want. Yeah, let's take a look at the SWAC. The Southwestern Athletic Conference is Tab Florida a and Jamari Cassette, Texas Southern's Javias Williams, Alabama State's Amon Scarborough, and Jackson State's Gerardo Baeza, and Prairie View's James Burns with SWAC Football Weekly Honors for their outstanding performances. Let's take a look at the Offensive Player of the Week, Jamari Gassette, another dominant performer. Five receptions, 118 yards, one receiving touchdown. He also had two punt returns for 40 yards and a punt return touchdown. The co-defensive players of the week, Javias Williams from Texas Southern, and he led the Tigers with nine tackles and three tackles for a loss in Texas Southern, held Grambling to 256 yards of total offense. Yvonne Scarborough from Alabama State, he recorded eight tackles, including six solo stops and one tackle for a loss, his interception in the Alabama A&M's final drive and seal the Hornets' 27-19 win at the Magic City Classic. Specials of the week was Gerardo Beza, G-Baby, as he is known in Jackson, had a perfect day kicking the ball in Jackson State's 37-17 victory over Bethune-Cookman. Uh, he connected on all three of his field goals. Uh, he converted, converted kicks of 24, 39, and 28 yards and also connected on all four of his extra point attempts. And the newcomer of the week was James Burns from Prairie View. He led all Prairie View A&M rushers with 76 yards and one touchdown during the Panthers' win over Texas A&M Commerce. He also added 139 receiving yards and two receiving touchdowns. And those are your SWAC. Players of the week. Good stuff. Good stuff. Ad Drew, give us some updates on the MEAC players of the week. South Carolina State quarterback Eric Phoenix was named MEAC Athletic Conference Mid Eastern Athletic Conference Offensive Player of the Week, presented by Coca Cola. South Carolina State defensive lineman Jaden Broughton earned Defensive Player of the Week. What, what conference have I heard those two names in before? Flashbacks, <laughs> 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 yeah. flashbacks, man. Uh, Delaware State, uh, Mikhail Davis and Justice 
Johnson were named rookie, were named the rookie and offensive lineman of the week, respectively. No folks, Jalen White earned specialist of the week. Let's go inside the numbers. Phoenix uh, completed 80, 85.7%. I just saw this number for the first time. Wow. Uh, passes for 341 yards and four tutties in the 69-35 win over Delaware State. We know it's basketball season, and uh, South Carolina State had to prove it. Uh, <laughs> by the you we all, all four times for 30 yards and one, and one touchdown also. Broughton had six solo uh, tackles. Uh, all his tackles were solo in South Carolina State's victory over Delaware State. He had five tackles for – Five of those were tackles for a loss of 17 yards with count on four of those tackles for a loss, counting as sacks. Wow. Brought added two forced fumbles to the top of a strong defensive uh, performance. And looking at the note says he also had a partridge and a pear tree. All right. Keep keep going. Davis uh, registered 60 yards on 7 of 18 passes, including 15 your uh, touchdown pass and the Hornets lost to South Carolina State. He got an eight carries for 19 yards. That's an offensive tackle. Recorded a blocking grade of 90% with three pancakes as the Hornets accumulated 322 yards of total offense. <laughs> Excuse me, y'all. And White ran back a 97-yard kickoff return for a touchdown, shifted momentum in the Spartans' 21-20 victory over Howard. And those, ladies and gentlemen, and lab rats or your BA performance of the week. Good stuff, good stuff. Shout out to the MEAC swag players of the week. I want to add one. Finally, see everybody got somebody some recognition from our independent HBCUs. Hampton, big win this past weekend. And see our double A football rookie of the week was Michael yeah. Matthews Canty, freshman linebacker Hampton from Fredericksburg. Virginia, St. Michael's, the Archangel, was in the building. Making just his second start at linebacker, Matthews Canty tallied five tackles as part of a dominant defensive effort in Hampton's 41-21 win over Elon. The freshman more than doubled his season total of tackles to help the Pirates hold the Phoenix to six first downs, minus 28 yards rushing and 160 total yards. I should say only 160 total yards. What's it? What direction you want to go with some of the news of the day? So I'm going to go into the Spartans, Norfolk State. They got a win against uh, Howard this weekend. They were named the HBC oh, Plus FCS National Team of the Week for MeXports.com, Norfolk State. Uh, the Spartans got back in the win column in emphatic fashion on Saturday, taking down defending MEAC champion Howard 21-20 in front of a sold-out crowd at William Dick Price Stadium. Uh, after trailing by as much as 10 in the first half, Norfolk State rallied from behind to pull the home pull out the homecoming victory. Kavon King scored the go-ahead touchdown in the fourth quarter before the NSU defense closed things out from there. Uh, redshirt junior Jalen White, who on Saturday became the first Norfolk State player since Marcus Taylor in 2017 to return a kickoff for a touchdown, also received an honorable mention nod in the special teams player of the week category. Uh, Norfolk State returns to the field on Saturday at 1 p.m. traveling to Baltimore to face Morgan State at Hughes Stadium. Good stuff. Good notes, man. And these folks talking about whether the coach was BS and <laughs> who's going to get let go. <laughs> It'd be interesting. Hi, so Lennon. Coaches still fighting <laughs> and saying that they're going to end the season at eight and three. Uh, uh, but we'll see. We'll see what it looks like. I do want to give a shout out before we take this last break and get into some matchups. We'll go mid major and some major ones that you want to talk about. But Alabama State and Alabama AM in the Magic City Classic. <laughs> 69,125. And remember, folks, this was not just the marketing of the marketing group. This is when you had Alabama AM, Alabama State, when they decided to make their own move, at least Alabama AM, they were they were gonna do their own marketing. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks were excited about it. Some folks were a little concerned on what that may look like. But this is huge coming off all that to be able to. In that first year, if you would, coming back in the mix, 69,125. Kudos to them. As you talked about, Norfolk State, Howard, kudos for homecoming, 31,876. Norfolk State, uh, some significant crowds there. I just wanted to point out uh, some of the games that were in the mix. They had a couple of 20,000, 
22,000. South Carolina State, Delaware State, FAMU Southern, 16,487. A little disappointed with that. Prairie View, Texas A&M Commerce, 13, 937. Morgan State, 13,000. Uh, Arkansas, Mississippi Valley grew 12,000. Uh, Jackson State, Bethune, Cookman, 11,000. There, Fort Valley State, Morehouse had 11,000 in that mix. And Texas Southern, Grambling State had 10,000 as well. With that being said, exactly. Uh, Ross, what do you what do you what do you what do you want to jump in the mix? Just makes me wonder what the Bayou Classic crowd is going to look like this year. There's a benchmark. There's sixty nine thousand. Hmm. Just curious. <laughs> you know the big difference, though, Charles. Hmm. While the Bayou may get more people inside the Mercedes Benz, uh, is it, no, it's not. It's, it's Caesar's now, right? Caesar's has it. Caesar's, Caesar's Superdome. Superdome. Yeah. Uh, I guarantee you, there will be more. Always be more people outside of Legion Field than outside. <laughs> I guarantee you, there, there, there were there were one hundred thousand people in the area. Only only seventy thousand of them decided to go into the stadium. There was another thirty thousand outside. Good points. Let's talk about a couple of these mid major matchups. Jump back on that a little bit. Let's look at this first one. Kind of hinted at this when we did the mid major poll rankings. Number seven, Tuskegee Golden Tigers sit at five and three, five and one. At number six, Clark Atlanta Panthers sit at five and two, one, and four and two in conference play. Obviously, a lot at, at stake, particularly for Golden Tigers. They sit at just five and one. They're on their chance to make the championship game. A lot of people question to some degree when we talked about the rankings, the toughness of their schedule. They played who was in front of them, but they got a chance to make a statement. But you have that on the other side. Clark Atlanta Panthers had a starling start of the season. They have a chance to make a pretty solid statement, close things out, specifically make sure they have a winning season. I think that's on the line for both these teams, even though Golden Tigers, we said, probably have more that they want to get accomplished. But all things being considered, Clark Atlanta gets to a winning season, keeps themselves to some degree just outside of the race a little bit. I think that's a major matchup for both teams in various ways. Uh, the importance of trying to get this done. This is at, in Atlanta. Uh, so another chance to play on the red carpet there. Fascinating. And I want to hear what your thoughts on this. Wilton, what direction are you going in terms of this matchup? Uh, I'm looking to see if Clark Atlanta is going to continue to maintain their momentum. I think those first couple weeks of the season, I'm one included. Uh, definitely riding high on them. Still hadn't necessarily changed that, but this is a, another really big test. When you look at, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Clark Atlanta's schedule, obviously after that big win against Bethune Cookman, I think that's when we really kind of started to give them a little bit more, I don't necessarily want to say clout, but I, I guess a little bit more seriousness to what they were going to become as a program. And getting a, Tus a Tuskegee team that's really hot, like you talk about teams that, you know, they always say, you may not always start the season the way you want it, but if you get hot at the right time, it changes everything. They're going to get a, a strong test from Tuskegee uh, in this game. Good thing for Clark Atlanta, I think, that uh, them playing at home, I think they'll potentially get this win. Uh, and I'm sticking with Clark Atlanta. Good one. Good one. Charles, what do you say? Uh, very interesting contest. Uh, like I said, I, I think Tuskegee has quite a bit of momentum, but uh, we talked about it. Uh, their past five opponents, uh, their uh, combined record, 9-33. Uh, yeah. But Tuskegee is the number one scoring defense in the SIAC, uh, but they have not seen an offense like Clark. Uh, I think you look behind those numbers a little bit. Uh, Tuskegee really doesn't get to the quarterback. Uh, I think they only have 16 sacks on the season, and I think that's one of the things that you have to do. You have to get to David Wright. Uh, so for that reason alone, uh, I, I'm going to go with Clark in this game because I think uh, Clark has the ability to outscore Tuskegee. Eddie, Drew, I want to get your thoughts on the matchup. Obviously, I know you can't talk about the score because of the position and your connection uh, to multiple teams in, in a lot of ways. But what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? Hey, let's go back to back in the preseason. I said Tuskegee had the easiest schedule out of every team in the SEC. Now, no one factored in the Savannah State loss into that schedule. But even with that, <laughs> if there was one team that I knew could realistically rebound and stay in contention just based on their schedule, I knew it was Tuskegee. Let's think about this. A Tuskegee win sets up real drama next week. 
right. in, in my AC. Right. Because not only when Tuskegee, when Tuskegee and Miles play each other next week, obviously a Miles win gives them the conference, conference championship. And a Tuskegee loss two miles would knock them out, assuming both Fort Valley and Albany win this week. Because that, that means that the winner next week would only have one loss. But let's yeah, that, that's too easy, y'all. Let's have some fun. Just <laughs> beat Clark. Here comes chaos guy. Yeah. Just <laughs> beat, beat miles. Both teams, seven and one in conference. Albany State, Fort Valley win this week. One of them's going to knock the other one off next week. Seven and one in conference. <laughs> so all three teams have basically not we can get chaos. All three teams have not played each other. <laughs> now, somewhere in there, it, it, you know, with all those one losses, is is the strength of loss, as I call it. Unfortunately, if we get down to that tiebreaker, Tuskegee is out because of the loss to Savannah State. Mm. Because of where Savannah State's going to finish at in the ranking. Great breakdown, because I was just gonna say in your analysis with Savannah State being four and four and three and three, is that loss that bad? But when you put all the contexts around it, now it's easy to see how that's a tough loss. Right. Uh I'm trying to remember who did who did Albany lose to? Uh, Albany lost to no. Let me back that up. Albany lost to Kentucky. Did not Albany lose to Kentucky State? Let me no. see. They 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 lost to uh, they they lost to Miles. Okay, that's qual that's a quality loss. Yeah. So who did, who did they lost to Miles? They lost to Shaw and they lost to no, uh, they lost to State. I'm talking about conference. So, so for Valley lost to who? Can somebody see what Fort, Fort Valley lost to? Yeah, Fort Valley lost to uh, – uh, they lost at Delta State. Oh, they lost to Clark to start the season off. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think uh, based on how everybody's going to finish, the Savannah State is going to go loss right now. It's going right, because if you go proceeding to your loss in terms of where they rank at the finish, they would be ranked lower than the other two teams that lost. Un unless Morehouse could pull off the upset. And beat Clark Atlanta next week. This event, and then you may have. Yeah, then they slide down. They Clark Atlanta slides down. Oh, I, I don't. I, I hope that don't like happen. It is like no fun as long as not finish more out. You, you don't. You don't blast the matches. I'll let y'all pick and see if anything uh, stands out in these matches before we take a last break and come back and look at the major. Of this. We got Benedict Tigers at. Essentially, number 10, Fort Valley State Wildcats. We have number eight, Virginia State Trojans at Lincoln, Pennsylvania. We have Fayetteville State, the Broncos at number one, Johnson C. Smith Golden Bulls. We have Bluefield, Big Blue at number two, Virginia Union Panthers. And as I said, just for the scoring part of it, essentially you have Albany State since they're in the race at the end. I went ahead and Drop the rankings all the way down. They be number eleven, Golden Rams at Savannah State Tigers four and four three and three. It is a race. Any of you see any of these teams losing this week? Charles, any of them losing this week is the first question. Yes, no, no. no. Which one teams? Second follow up question. Which team would you say it had the biggest probability of potentially? Losing? I think Auburn State going to Savannah State. I think that's. That that at least uh, oh, raises my eyebrow. Yeah, Wilton. Any of those teams have a chance of losing? No, I, I don't. I don't Do think you so. Agree with Charles in terms of the toughest one potentially being Savannah State, Albany State. Or are you going in a different direction? No, I was going to choose that just kind of based off uh, uh, Albany State schedule and, and how things are shaking shaking up, and then the uh, win that Savannah State has gotten. So I would definitely say that game too. AD Drew, I know you love chaos, but any of those four teams, any of them going to lose? Honestly, no. Did, did you mention uh, – <laughs> did you mention <laughs> Sean Livingston? Livingston in your four. No, because they weren't really ranked seven, so I was just going with those teams. Okay, I, yeah. I mean, just like just like last week, 
uh, we didn't have too many sexy matchups last week uh, when it came to the mid-major level, uh, at least in the SIEC. This week, CIAA doesn't have any sexy matchups. You, you could, you know, you got a couple of cute matchups in the SIEC, but they're not, they're not super sexy. I like the cute, <laughs> not superstar <laughs> status. <laughs> no. mm-hmm. They're not prime time. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Let's take our last break. We're going to come back in what a lot of folks are waiting for. The big matchup in the MEAC is actually a Thursday night game. We're going to yes. give these women a chance to talk a little early about that. We'll take a really deep dive on Thursday, if you would. But we're going to touch on it tonight and see if there's any other games that these guys want to talk about. But we'll spend some time on that matchup. Yeah. This was the one that everybody, A.D. Drew, you can call this one the sexy matchup, if you would. We'll be right back after the break and talk about that. that, that, That's a superstar. (laughs) (laughs) We'll be right back after this break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Supermarket Sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? (laughs) Oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Hey, grab me one too. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll it back, everybody. <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot of And who the ball, who the ball So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, And pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. We have none other than Charles Bishop, A.D. Drew, and Wilton Jackson the second. With that being said, this is the second matchup. Big sex is some people said up there. <laughs> Four matchup, if you would. Number one, North Carolina Central Eagles, 6-2, and 2-0. Two, two and oh. <coughs> South Carolina State Bulldogs, the rebuilt Bulldogs that are back in action, 5-2. and two. As you see, uh, both are undefeated in the conference race. Uh, everybody kind of looked at this potential matchup early in the season, but I'm not sure if they looked at it in terms of this beat. Well, with based on what the other teams have done, uh, in terms of what they've done all season, this matchup becomes even bigger than you think. Halloween, if you would, uh, be in the house. A lot of scary things happen on Halloween. Some people would say some weird things happen on Halloween. Eagles have had their troubles in Orangeburg. A lot of teams have their troubles in Orangeburg, good or not. I'm fascinated to see what these gentlemen have to say about this matchup. I'm not sure how much I can flex 
and put it out there more than this. Uh, Wilton Jackson the second. Uh, I'm gonna go to you first and give you the opportunity to kind of shine. What do you think in this New York matchup? So when I look at this matchup in the beginning of the season, because I did, we didn't we didn't necessarily know what North Carolina Central was gonna look like, obviously without Davis Richard, and we didn't know what South Carolina State was gonna look like in Chinnis Bear's first year. Mm-hmm. But I was I've, I've said on this show and on several shows that I was high on Chinnis Bear. Now I gotta stand on that. And I'm standing on that this week. Oh! I think that they, oh! I think I think they're gonna be North Carolina Central. I do. Uh, I think it's gonna be a close game. Um, I think that the continuity that because well, both teams have continuity on the offensive line, but I think that that continuity with South Carolina State's offensive line and what Eric Phoenix has been able to do, uh, I'm not sold on on Central's defense in terms of being able to slow him down completely enough to where they can't win the game. Um, I, I think that if they can they can maintain balance, if South Carolina State can maintain balance and run the ball and Phoenix still does what he does, I think they can get this win. I really do. It'll shock a lot of people. I know I know Josh somewhere out there, like, I know he didn't just say that they can do <laughs> I know he's mad somewhere. I know he's gonna look at this and be like, did he really just say that? But I got it. I, I'm a I'm a go, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say South Carolina State is gonna get this get this win. I do think it's gonna be an extremely close game, though. Good call. Good. Fascinating. AD Drew, what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? Number one versus number four. Number one goes on the road in conference play. I'm going to uh, pull out my inner Mike Washington and pull out some data points. And speaking of Mike Washington, Mike, you can't do homecoming like <laughs> the folks that do church and go twice a year to church. You know, Christmas and Easter. Mike, <laughs> you just come to the show more than Christmas and Easter, my brother. <laughs> More than homecoming in the classic. I need you to come back to the show more, more than one, more than, more than twice a year, my brother. But anyway, uh, pulling out, uh, you know, Mike Washington, looking at some data points, Dr. Kabir. Number one offense, North Carolina Central. Mm. Number three defense, South Carolina State. Mm. Number two offense, South Carolina State. Number two defense, North Carolina Central. Scoring uh, offense. Number one, South Carolina State. Number two, scoring defense, North Carolina Central. Number two, scoring offense, North Carolina Central. Number two, scoring defense, South Carolina State. Oh, I'm not done, y'all. Number one, rushing offense, North Carolina Central. Number one, rushing defense, South Carolina State. Let's keep going. Number, uh, number one, passing offense, South Carolina State. Number two, passing defense, North Carolina Central. So, I mean, I I could keep going on and on. I told you this was strength on strength. Normally, you get these type of games where, yeah, you got a team with a good pass game against a team that has a, a bad pass defense or something. You should get some some type of some type of yep. where you yep. can go and, and and lean your pick. But when you look at the, the the numbers, you know, you look at the column on the left, you see the one team. You look at the column on the right. You see the other team's defense. So this is I, this is how sexy this matchup is. She's prime time. You taking her to the movies at five o'clock in the afternoon. You're not uh-huh. going. To, you're not going to the mid- midday matinee. You're not going and catching the midnight show. You want everybody to see this date. That's <laughs> what this matchup is. And we go and sit down in in the restaurant with the valet parking. And 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 the seats in the front. Taxi, taxi, taxi. Good stuff. Good stuff. So we're gonna hold off on eighty Drew and uh, wait till we get closer to the matchup to get this pick. But that being said, Charles, what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? I think people set up the dinner table for you to bring it home. Well, I, I have to agree with AD. I mean, this is the Whitley Gilbert game. She's she pretty and fine. I mean, this <laughs> this the one you want. I mean, uh, it is strength on strength. And I'm going to take the non-scientific approach. Whoever gives me the better <laughs> pregame speech. Because both of them, <laughs> they both going to be with, good. Both Ooh, of them come with oh, but, the pregame. <laughs> but, but, but I, I kind of lean towards Chennis because I've, I've, I've seen Chennis' pregame speech. I've been there for Chennis' pregame speech. I mean, I, you know, I can imagine what the halftime speech is. Chin has got to be one of the top orators when it comes to just firing you up 
without yeah. the full letter words. Yeah, my mama wanted to run through a wall. I sent her the video tape of Chinnis and Pan. Like, where they get him from? I said, yeah, yeah, he, he real now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it comes down to uh, whether South Carolina State can stop Jamar Taylor. I, I really do believe in, in North Carolina Central's running game. Uh, and, and, you know, there isn't a weakness uh, to me Well, when you're talking to either one. But if I'm going to pin something somewhere, I always love a good running game and I love, love a good feature back. And I think uh, North Carolina Central has one of the best in HBCU football. And, I mean, the lights are bright. It's Thursday night. Uh, everybody will be watching. Uh, even in the midst of my homecoming festivities, I will make sure I get an opportunity to catch this game. So uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I, you know, I'm just I'm gonna take North Carolina Central on the road. But I tell you what, if South Carolina State wins, I'm Chance needs to set out a hop. That I, I I need to see that. I need to see that out of head coach. I need to see that. I need to see him set out a hop. Oh, <laughs> boy, just do it if they win. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Boy, he's not right for that one. He's not right for that. Go ahead. That's a question related to this game. Mm -hmm. The loser of this game mm. get an FCS playoff spot based on this based on this game, assuming that they went out the rest of the season. Is this I enough think, to get to the mean? Mm -hmm. I think for sure Central, South Carolina State, a little tougher, but if they win out, they're going to have a hell of an argument. Mm -hmm. Hell of an They'll be what eight and three. Uh, moving out, winning quality lost to FAMU. Yeah, winning three in a row. Quality lost to FAMU. Quality, it'd be a quality loss to Central if they. They have a couple of quality FCS wins. Yes, they do have the D two. Um, win on there, and maybe they might may have a better argument to Central now. You think about because Central has the. Uh, um, Lynchburg on there. Lynchburg on the schedule. Yeah. Now I think they have what two FCS wins as well. So it'll be interesting. You're right that they're they're going to be interested. I think Central. The reason I lean Central because they're higher in the poll, which means in most people's eyes they're a little higher in the rankings. No, they don't use the poll for the analysis, but it's still a good judge in terms of where people are in terms of the index. Is it too soon to say this game is for the celebration poll? No. 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 That was my next one. You own it, y'all. Yeah. I think this is for the celebration bowl, um, particular when you talk about the other teams. Um, Norfolk State, they've already had the loss to the Eagles. Obviously, they have a chance if they if the win is by the Bulldogs, so you still got that matchup there. But it's hard for me to believe that Norfolk State is not going to end up with another loss. Howard, the way they're playing right now, struggling at quarterback. Uh, can they find a way and run it without getting at least one more loss in conference play? Hmm. Uh, and in Delaware State, they're certainly struggling. And so you start to run out of teams. Morgan State, while they have a championship level defense, I would argue, offense, there's no way you can believe that they're going to run off four games uh, with that offense. Yeah. Wilton? No, I just wanted to pose a point to Charles. You were saying um, about the South Carolina State, North Carolina Central game and South Carolina State being able to stop Jamar Taylor. You know, South Carolina State has two running backs, too, and they do. You know, they do hard in Casey Adams. And I'm wondering, yeah. like, you know, if you had to choose which one would have the most dominant production on the field, which one would you choose? And that's why I just started leaning towards Jamar Taylor. Uh, and that, that was the difference. Uh, like you mentioned, two quality backs. Uh, but uh, if I'm putting them, if I'm stacking them, yeah. I, I got to go with Taylor. Yeah. I, I've seen Mark carry the mail, and and he and he can carry a truckload. Yeah, he is. Oh, for sure. Man, you know, he's a great drunk breaking this down. We're going to get you out of here after this. We're not going to do analysis on the game, but we're going to tease it. We'll do more on Thursday. But since you brought up playoffs, I thought it was important to look at this UT Martin Skyhawks that sit at 5-3, and 3-1. Three, three and one. At number three, Tennessee State Tigers, 6-2, and 3-1. and one. Um, I think this is important, obviously, for the conference race to stay in that. Um, also, I think in terms of playoffs, they need this game such that they can make that Southeast Missouri game to win the conference. And even if you roll out all the way to that game and you ultimately can lose that game close, um, then you're sitting at, you know, eight and three yourself, you know, finishing what that five and one in conference play two or whatever. 
do they have a chance to say that uh, they should be in the playoffs, even if they don't win the conference with the long loss coming at the end of the season, the sumo? Charles? Uh, I mean, this is that, that sort of game that Tennessee State has to prove it to them. Uh, so that I, I know that they are for real. I think they have a very good team. I expect them to get the win because I, I think they are going to be in that conversation. They are a different looking ball club this season. Particularly at home. Wilton? Yeah. Uh, I think Tennessee State will get the win. Uh, just kind of seeing who they, they played this season. It, it just feels like this team is a little bit different. I've seen some of the growth in Draylon Ellis at quarterback, some yeah. of the continuity they've had on the offensive line, even defense. I mean, defense wasn't necessarily uh, bad last year. It was really more so their offense being consistent. And so I think this year they've had that continuity and that consistency. And I think this is the year that that, that uh, Coach George and, and what the program is doing, I think they get over the hump. They get this win. A.D. Drew? Tennessee State gets in for one factor. One of only two HBCUs to play a all-FCS schedule so that you can get a proper evaluation of them. No Division twos, yep. no FBS is on the schedule this year. That's going to help them in this case if what you said, Dr. Kabir, plays out. That should be enough for them to get into the playoffs. The committee doesn't have to worry about dropping games and statistics in certain games. They can give them a full evaluation based on those 11 games that they have. Great point. Great point. That was for you, Sneaker Shop Talk, in terms of getting a little Tennessee State talk in there. That'll do it for us. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. So I'm, not, I'm picking Tennessee State. I'll see you. <laughs> if you're refusing to come to the swag. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I am Dr. Kenyatta Kavir, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. As I said, again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Kavir's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday, 6 o'clock standard time. Obviously, we'll be back on Thursday. I'll be traveling, heading this time to Chicago, the Windy City. See if I can get some deep dish pizza or something. We'll let you know what that looks like. We look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. That's Twitter because I can, Facebook, Instagram, inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Facebook and YouTube is inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Wilton? Lecture. Eighty. Yes, miss. Great show.